the absurdity of vaccination science is revealed in a study that was just published in the prestigious medical journal Clinical Infectious Diseases, claiming that the flu virus results in less disease risk because of the production of antibodies in spite of not reducing the likelihood of contracting the disease and also resulting in five and a half times more incidence of similar respiratory diseases. That's hard to believe. When I saw that come out, I thought, what? You know, there were a couple of, of journal articles that came out uh, uh, in, the, in, 19, in 2009, one that showed in Canada that the people who got the flu vaccine actually had more influenza, more, more flu. And also another article that came out just this last year in the U.S. showing the same thing. So this idea of looking at other illnesses is a very good one. You're right. Well, my question is, like, what's going on here? Right. And how and why do we sell vaccinations that don't work? And can we break through the brainwashing of flu vaccinations? Right. Well, so far we haven't been able to. And it is brainwashing because this is not built on solid science. This is built on good, solid business. And when you make hundreds of billions of dollars off the sale of vaccines, it's a huge thing to keep in mind. And that is what keeps this vaccine industry doing what it does. But what is the deal about the, the, the vaccinations and the antibodies? Because a mm. lot the scientists are claiming that the antibodies are supposed to kill the virus. Well, antibodies are good for some infections. And you'd like to think that if there's a substance in the body that has immune capacity to be able to kill something, that you don't want there, like a virus or a bacteria, that's good. But that's not the natural way that we get infections. And so when you, you get a viral infection, like, like influenza or Coxsackie or Echo or some of these other viruses that we get, they aren't given by injection. We get that when people sneeze and we inhale it and gets into our mucous membranes. And when it gets on that surface, it does something different. It stimulates a different kind of immune response because there are, there are two kinds of immune responses. One is the body makes antibodies and the antibodies work pretty well against bacterial infections and they might have some effect on viruses, not a whole lot. The big thing that we have is a second kind of arm of the immune system that makes cells, immune cells, that activate by ingesting viruses and cancer cells to kill them. And that's what's different between the immunization and with the, with the natural infection. So in other words, it's better to get a disease naturally and build up antibodies that way than it is to get it with a vaccine. Well, not quite. And not antibodies, but to build up cellular immunity. There's also some benefit from the antibodies, and that's why you learned that in school. It comes out automatically from you because that's something to keep in mind, too. But, the, but it sounds a, like the antibodies only work against bacteria then and not so much against viruses. Not so much against viruses, but they are a marker that's of interest because that's good. But what you also have to take into perspective is if you have an immunization, what happens is different in your body. And that's why when you take the measles, mumps, rubella, all these other vaccines that we take, by the time you're in your 20s or 30s, you don't have that same protection as if you had the natural infection. So and like that's when, what we're dealing with. So like when we were kids, yeah, they we didn't had, have the vaccine for the, right, for the chicken Prehistoric times, so that's forth. right. Yeah. <laughs> and so we didn't get it again. And that's some people right. can get it again, I guess. And when you get it later in life, oh, it's much see, more serious. Oh, but see, then that can make more money because then you can go get another vaccine. <laughs> well, that's part of what's happening. And I don't think it's all premeditated, but I think a lot of it is. And we've got some good scientists working on this kind of, uh, on this topic, but you have to look at the whole picture of what's happening and you have to unravel some of the things that are happening that are run by the CDC and the FDA and the World Health Organization. And NIH. Well, yeah, and these are pretty corrupt things that are happening. When you look at what happened with the swine flu vaccine in 2010, 2009 and 10, that was an outright conspiracy. There was no good data to show that the swine flu was any worse than any other flu season, and it wasn't. And what we wound up doing was tracking a cold all over the world, changing the definition of what an epidemic was, and convincing people that if they didn't take the, the swine flu vaccine, that they surely would die or be seriously injured from it. That's not right, and that's not what we should be doing when it comes to scientific medicine. Well, it sounds like all these organizations then, like you were just mentioning, the CDC and the FDA and the World Health Organization, the NIH, are 
pretty much corrupt them. A lot of I this is They're true. not really protecting us. In this situation, they're not. And you have to also look at the revolving door that exists between the CDC and the FDA with the pharmaceutical industry. It's not uncommon for the heads of these departments or people who are in those departments to move from one department to the other. And in the case of Julie Gebberding, who's an MD, who was the chief of the CDC until Obama came into office, she now works for who? Merck. Yeah. <laughs> Pharmaceutical. Yeah. And she runs what? Their immunization department. And she's making a ton of money, has stock options. And of course, she, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many other people, is, is taking advantage of the monetary things that she could have by doing a favor to the pharmaceutical industry. You see the same thing coming down in all kinds of political areas. Money talks. And when there's a lot of it, they can buy votes in, in Congress. They can buy votes in the FDA and CDC. And they can own people who are in it is what it seems like. One of the other things that I wanted to bring up here was how studies are so often done with placebos. They call them double-blinded, mm. placebo-controlled studies. Right. Talk about the types of placebos that they use for the flu vaccine, the mm -hmm. active and the inactive, and what the difference is, because yeah. I think this is important for people to be aware of this. Right. I mean, it's very tricky on the part of the people who are doing research on immunizations to go ahead and give the immunization with the antigen, with the uh, killed uh, virus in it, so it, maybe the, the swine flu virus in it, and as a placebo to use the vaccine but without uh, the antigen in it. That's not the right placebo. The right placebo is to compare the vaccine with the antigen in it to saline. It doesn't have all these other things. The other that additives. Are, yeah, that are influencing what happens. So it was a sleazy way of doing business or doing research in my, in my mind. And what I see in the research industry is a tremendous amount of contamination of conflict of interest because who's funding these studies? They're swaying the results. It's not right. Well, the people that are doing the studies are mostly the pharmaceutical industry. One third or about $30 billion a year is spent by the National Institutes of Health. The, the pharmaceutical industry spends $92 billion. Now you're talking about a huge difference, and I can't, in the amount of research that's being funded by someone that has a conflict of interest, rather than doing just straight research from the National Institutes of Health, where there are no conflicts of interest. Can you imagine a pharmaceutical representative who is in the, in the FDA, which is very common, about 20% or 25% of FDA people are actually from the pharmaceutical industry and they have votes. Could you imagine them coming back to work after voting against what their company said on the following Monday morning and see what would happen? Boy, the flack would fly. Well, they'd be let go. Yeah. They would probably lose their job. So here we have all these conflicts of interest. This is not great science. That's why Marsha Angel, the doctor who ran or was a chief editor of the New England Journal of Medicine for a long time, quit her job and said that, that the information that was coming across her desk was not worthy of being published in this prestigious journal. Very serious well, accusations. If and if you're interested in, in more, more about the flu vaccine, you can go to, to drsaputo.com and put in the infection deception where Dr. Saputo has a 15-page synopsis of the whole right. thing and this and was published you can follow the history it's published it. in the townsend letter for doctors and and uh, patients and it really is a f i follow the what happened with the flu va the swine flu vaccine every day for about nine months and published what i found and the revelation is stunning and what it does is it, it confirms what the suspicions i had that we need to take a hard look at immunizations and we're looking at these kinds of uh of studies that show, even though they're small, a 5.5 times increase in incidence of other infections, it's telling you the vaccine must be doing something to change that kind of immunity, that cellular immunity that we need when we're talking about viral infections or cancers. And plus, they even know that it doesn't reduce the risk of getting the flu. Right. Well, see, it's all about business. Unfortunately, business has taken over the practice of medicine. We need to reclaim it. We need to change the paradigm from disease care to health care. And we have to stop believing all these things that our pediatricians just kind of reflexively learn because it's written in a textbook or the CDC is making some kind of statement. And there's so much pressure put on people to get these flu vaccines. Right. I mean, many of the health workers are 
required to wear a mask if they don't get the flu vaccine. And then people look at them differently, like they're they're bad because they didn't get the flu shot and right. they're contaminating their patients. Not, so they have to wear this mask to protect their patients. Yeah, well, in some places, they actually uh, won't let you work there if you don't take the immunization. Well, I think that'd be a very interesting lawsuit because the data behind uh, sponsoring these immunizations is not very strong. Well, the other thing that's interesting is that the nose drops, you can catch the flu from that's somebody. A different, that's that, a live virus. Vaccine. Yeah, but, but somebody, you can catch the flu from somebody that's had that particular type of a vaccine. Right. So what's our take home message here? We don't recommend the flu vaccine, just in case you <laughs> might have been wondering what our position was. And really what we should do is lifestyle medicine. We should eat right, get enough sleep, exercise regularly, Lower yeah, our stress sun. levels. Yeah, get out in the sunlight. And chances are you won't have to worry about these nuisance colds that are going around that have had a, a lot of hype and use words like pandemic. <laughs>